So we are live. Hey, and uh, welcome to our last workshop of our enterprise scale NLP workshop series with Amazon SageMaker. Um, we will wait just a few minutes. Uh, feel free to say hello in the chat. Um, where are you from? Um, what you are interested in today's workshop? All right, we have people from India. Wow, what time is it over there? <laughs> You're crazy. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Amazing. <laughs> and lots of different places. Yeah, that's awesome. 11.31 PM, oh, come on. That's dedication. <laughs> Australia 4 a.m. Okay, okay, all right. That's not, now that, this one's <laughs> all right. I think you win. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I might need to change like the slide. I think it's not any more the tenth for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's ahead. <laughs> all right. Wow, it's it's really a global audience. I mean, it's you know U.S. all over Europe, India, Australia, Bangladesh, Egypt, Estonia. Nice. All right, Mexico. <laughs> nice. Great. I think we can start, and then for everyone who's joining uh, a bit later, yeah, I think sure. it's, it's, it's not an issue since we're just going through the instruction step. And for those of you who have or like already attended the first workshop and the second workshop, I think which just will be like um, a repetition in any ways. So yeah, welcome to the the ML Ops uh, end to end hugging face transformers uh, with the Hub and SageMaker pipelines workshop. So what we are going to do is we are going to use the SageMaker pipeline. Um, service to create an end to end machine learning pipeline where we have different steps for processing, training, evaluation, and then deployment, of course. And we will go through each step with all of you, and you will all have the option to run um, the notebook um, side by side. And um, to who's joining with me today, so we have Nate again who will keep an eye on the chat. So if you have any questions, Feel free to um, write them into the chat. We will like go through all of them while doing the session. Then we have joining Julian Simon, uh, our chief evangelist, and then myself and Mathieu from AWS. And then in addition, we have a new release Discord where we have like a dedicated Hugging Face SageMaker channel. So if you have any questions after the workshop or in the next couple of weeks, join our Discord, happy to connect you there. And then we have also a nice um, forum where you can ask questions to Transformers, to AWS, to SageMaker, and of course, all of the material we are going to show and what we have used in the last two workshops is available on GitHub. Then, Mathieu, feel free to take over. Yes, thanks. I will share my screen. Uh, for those who have already uh, attended to the previous workshop, you already know about SageMaker and the benefit of it. So uh, today I want to focus more on the reInvent that is uh, celebrating the 10 years uh, this year. And it's like the big conference of uh, Amazon to present uh, the, the new products uh, and, and especially uh, uh, them that is around uh, the IML. Uh, so, uh, I prepared just a couple of uh, slides to present like the my selection of uh, of session that you can watch uh, during the the reinvent. 
So the first one will be uh, the keynote from, uh, from Swami, that is the vice president of uh, Amazon Machine Learning. And so it happened on the 1st of December. Uh, we have uh, uh, the Peter's uh, keynote uh, around the infrastructure and maybe we'll hand on some new hardware for machine learning. So uh, I encourage you to join that. And to extend a bit, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, Adam, the new CEO of AWS that will present uh, the global keynote. And after that, uh, the reInvent is like three days of uh, learning. Uh, so you can join breakout session, uh, AWS Depressor, that is a, a competition of the IML uh, self-driving vehicle, and, uh, and attempt to some training and certification. Uh, of course, we have a Nugin phase dedicated session on, on the 29th of November. So I encourage you to uh, to join there. And also a couple of sessions that I put uh, on the side uh, around machine learning, uh, deep learning, TensorFlow, PyTorch that may interest you. So that is for the reInvent. And feel free to uh, to go to uh, reInvent.awsevents.com uh, to register. It's free uh, to, access, to access the, the, the virtual session. And so uh, today uh, for that workshop, we will access again to an AWS account to, uh, to let you the possibility to follow us and access to some compute resource. So uh, on the chat, uh, uh, Philippe should have uh, shared the, the dashboard that event engine that run uh, URL where you copy past the hash uh, in the, the field box and you click login. There you can sign up uh, using the email one-time password. Click on it, put your email address. I will receive it on my phone. and you will be redirected to uh, the team dashboard where you saw that the event is not running. So I will just start it uh, right now. Oh. And we have the page. So there you can uh, access the AWS console and click on the link open AWS console you will be radiated uh, with credential inside the, the AWS console. If it works. I've already logged from somewhere else. Okay, no problems. That's it. And from there, you can select SageMaker here or type on the uh, on the search box to access the service. Here we uh, already uh, instantiated some number some notebook for you. So you click notebook instance, and here you have a, a four notebook because you will be four assigned to the same icons. So please uh, pick one of them. And you see at the beginning, you have blue, green, yellow, and red. So I will take uh, the blue one and click Open Jupyter. From the Jupyter Notebook, we will go through uh, the, uh, the workshop free MLOps. Uh, so when you come here, just check if you have no uh, notebook running because it may uh, seems that someone else take the account before you. And so you can just go back uh, to the SageMaker console and take another one. You can see also uh, that when you load the notebook and uh, the notebook will be green there. So you just have to open it. 
and we already prepare all the code for you. So you can select uh, one version of uh, PyTorch there, or Python at least, and, uh, and you have your notebook running. So when it's uh, done, you have the green uh, book there, and you see that it's running. So uh, please make sure that you don't uh, use the same notebook on uh, someone else. And during that presentation, we will go through uh, the SageMaker planning plan that you can see uh, through the, the SageMaker Studio. So to access the studio, you can go to SageMaker domain and studio there and click uh, Launch App Studio. And from there, you will have uh, uh, around two minutes to start the studio. And, and Philippe and uh, Julien will guide you on that. So uh, it's finished for me, so you can take the end. All right, so OK. Right. Uh, I hope all of you um, already started to get access to your SageMaker account. If you are joining late and don't have access, feel free to like send a chat message. Then Nate will share the event engine link again. And um, what we will do like as first step is like not begin at the top as we would usually do, since we want to show you the, the result or like how the, the pipeline um, is run. So the first step we are going to do is to execute a pipeline. Uh, it takes around 30 minutes. So um, close before the end, we can then um, see the results of the pipeline. And now we go back like to the, to the main pipeline. And as um, Mathieu already said, so, you will share your AWS account potentially with different participants and you have like your notebook yellow, green, blue, and please uh, change your uh, or the end soon suffix to like the notebook you are running in because we are creating like different AWS services and resources which has uh, names um, applied to and if um, people are going to create like the resource with the same ID, one of you would see an error. So change the, the suffix to like the notebook color you are basically running in. Okay, so then the first step, um, since we are using, uh, or I'm alone and using the red one, and then we are going to install the latest SageMaker uh, SDK to make sure that we have all required packages we need for um, hanging phase, for transformers, for the SageMaker pipelines installed. And then we have basically a huge chunk of imports which are basically importing everything we need to create our pipeline. So the SageMaker pipeline um, yeah, consists out of multiple different steps. So we have like a step for processing, a step for training, and we are importing all of those. And then of course, to like get running to do things of AW in AWS, you always need permission. And the SageMaker or the notebook environment um, provides a nice uh, feature and functionality, then you can directly uh, assume a role uh, which is providing by the instance running so we can execute a cell and then I think we are now like ready to get started and in the beginning we have like a nice pipeline overview and Julian will like guide you through it what we do basically yeah so you know we try to to replicate something that's uh, pretty typical so of course first we have a, a data a data processing job to to process the, the data set and uh, so that's the uh, the first step of the pipeline loading the loading the data processing it and then we have a training step of course uh, when we train the model um, and sometimes your training goes well sometimes it doesn't so it's mm -hmm. important to check the uh, evaluation metric and so we have a an evaluation step where we look at uh, uh, the the output from the training job and if uh, if accuracy is good enough then we go and deploy uh, if it's not then we just uh, you know we we kind of uh, don't go further okay so assuming the the training uh, went well and the metric is fine then we go and deploy and uh, here we use a, a slightly different technique i guess uh, we're not deploying to a, a SageMaker endpoint we're deploying um, uh, we're deploying with a lambda function, right? So we are deploying to an endpoint, but we are using a lambda function to do it, uh, where, uh, which is an interesting way to show you the, the lambda step, okay? And in between, there's the a registration step, 
where we actually create the model in the, the SageMaker model registry. And the model registry is a way for you to um, uh, version your models and, uh, and, and deploy them uh, using different techniques. But this time, because I think Philip is a, is a Lambda fan, and uh, well, so am I, <laughs> we, we decided to show you the Lambda way. Okay? Yeah, right. so, so, so currently, all what SageMaker Pipeline provides is like, as Julian mentioned, is these different steps. And to be able to deploy, there's like no official like SageMaker Pipeline step to create the endpoint. Mm -hmm. And what we like wanted to have is, of course, like the full experience, like automatically running your training, which is like triggered by us, maybe or through another Lambda or maybe an event engine event, which is like um, like a cron shop or something. And then, of course, since we have like this condition inside of it, we are sure that we are like not deploying a garbage model. That's why we added like this automated step using a Lambda to create like the, the endpoint itself. And just just a quick comment on that. So you, you know, you could use pipelines for I would say development workflows, experimentation workflows, and and I guess this is what we're doing today. So we actually want to deploy and test uh, in in our own VPC in our own account. But you can also use it strictly for production in a fully automated way. So let's say you know this pipeline is really running completely automatically. Uh, maybe we, you know, launched it automatically, and and then um, you would want to have the model in the model registry uh, with a validation status, and then uh, another workflow would go and take that model, and probably deploy it in a different VPC or maybe in a different AWS account. Maybe and maybe you have manual validation. So that's why the model registry is really central. Uh, and and you could go and grab the artifact and deploy it somewhere else. Okay, but again, today we're going like Philip said, we're going end to end because <laughs> we want to show you the the whole story. Exactly, and I, I zoomed a bit in. I hope it's now better. <clears throat> and of course, like the pipeline has a lot of like um, configuration steps and different step. And what we are going to do is basically define like in step zero, since we are like all computer science uh, fanatical um our like <laughs> pipeline parameters um, and yeah. we have a, a parameter for like all of our artifacts so the pipeline or like the scripts we are going to use inside of the pipeline will be stored in s3 so that's we have our s3 prefix we define our bucket where we want to save like the model output the artifacts we have our region to make sure that we are like running in the same environment since like uh, as julian mentioned we could like train on US East one because they have like the P4 instance and we want to like yeah, run totally. huge GPU training. And then since we are like globally active, we want to deploy like across the globe into different yes. AWS regions. Yeah, yeah, that's to, another scenario. Absolutely. To to like Europe, um, like um, Asia, Africa. So that's something you could also do. That's why we are def uh, defining the region. Uh, we also say that like our all of our jobs are basically containing the same name as our, our S3 prefix. We make sure that we are like um, caching only for a, a certain amount of time since the test. And then we have like all the um, hugging phase re specific, I think, parameters. So we want to use the latest Transformers version with the latest PyTorch version with a, like a high enough Python version. And then in our example or in the pipeline we are going to create, we are going to use the distal bird model and the IMDB data set. And um, if you want to change it or if you want to use this pipeline for like a future project or at work, and you don't use the distal bird or the, data, uh, the IMDP data set, you can basically change the parameter here and then like go through the whole pipeline and then it works the same. So that's like what's really nice about it that you are like creating the pipeline once for like the text classification task in this case. And then you are like uh, able to like change it up with the different models we provide through the Hugging Face Hub. So we execute our configuration yeah and, and, and just then, just a quick comment yeah. uh and so the the workflow itself so the pipeline itself can have parameters and that's what you see uh, you know the parameter string objects in in, in that cell uh, so um so you you can actually build very generic pipelines that run um across different models across different data sets with different hyper parameters you know uh, who knows but uh yeah so the the just like cloud formation template just like everything else um you want to build pipelines that you can reuse over a wide range 
of, of applications, right? So these are what those parameter strings uh, are. It's a really, really important concept. Yeah, so like as Julie mentioned, we, we define in each step those parameters. And then like before executing it, we can override them or like adjust them. That's something we will see at the end that you will probably see like the, the name for processing instance type or like the model ID at the end again before like executing. And it's like a really nice way to have like one pipeline and then to configure it how you want. And then our first step is going to be the processing step. And currently the Hugging Face DLC are only available for training and for GPU. So what we are going to do, we are of course going to use like the most familiar uh, machine learning library out there, which is scikit-learn, which has a nice scikit-learn processor. Yeah. And then we are creating our um, processor and then we have a processing step. So each like step inside of the SageMaker pipeline is a step. SageMaker, the SDK provides a lot of like pre-existing uh, steps for processing or training. And then later we will see how we like use the Lambda step to, to do our um, our custom step. And then we provide, okay, which transformers we want to use. We have our model ID and data set again, which we have defined a bit earlier. Mm. And then um, of course, since we want to save the data set files afterwards and use it for training, we define our outputs, uh, which will be then saved to S3 of course, and it can be accessed by like the next step. So these output parameter we are defining here will be accessed inside the next step. Yeah. A quick comment on, on the syntax here. Uh, so some of you may be familiar with uh, SageMaker processing, right? Which is a, a batch, uh, the batch capability in SageMaker. And if you're familiar with them, if that, you can see it's exact same syntax, right? That sklearn processor um, definition is exactly the same. And, and in fact, um, that that's I, when you start automating. I, I recommend that you first um, build the the the, the S scaler the um, SageMaker processing steps independently, um, and then you can start combining them in the with the pipeline syntax. Um, you can literally cut and paste because sometimes you know writing the pipeline from scratch is a little bit too much, right? It's uh, it's a little verbose, it's, it can be a little confusing. So start by defining all the steps individually, just like you would run them manually in a, in a notebook and you know the estimator and the SageMaker processing steps, et cetera. And, and then you can very easily combine them with the pipelines because again, it, the syntax is 99% identical. Yeah, that's exactly what we are going to see like in the next step, which is a training step. Um, since we are using a distilbird as a license description to what distilbird is. And then we have again our parameter for which like entry point we are going to use and the hyperparameter. And if we scroll down a bit, um, I guess you will see something familiar for those of you have, who have used Hugging Face before. So we are going to use the Hugging Face estimator where we provide our entry point, our script. And you basically, that's that's the code you might have already written in your like default SageMaker training. Yeah, job. exactly. <laughs> and what we would do there is like a hiding face estimated on fit to execute our training step and to use it inside of SageMaker pipeline, we are creating our training step, which will then execute the dot fit method behind the scenes. And similar to our uh, dot fit method where we can provide our data set when calling it, we have our inputs here, which are um, from our process step, the output for training, and then of course the S3 URL. So this, this, this string here is the output of the step we run yep. before and we provide it into the next step. And this is how you automatically um, automatically chain the automatically step, chain right? Because step, right? if so one output becomes an input, then you kind of know which step goes first. Um, there's also a way to explicitly uh, create dependencies um, there's a, there's a parameter called depends on in, in the steps you'll find that in the SDK where you can you can force uh, the, the order of steps um, you know sometimes you want sequential things and and it's not obvious how you can connect them using outputs and inputs so you you can also force dependencies but generally yeah they, this is the really the, the best way to do it Yes, and maybe something we haven't mentioned. So I saw like Aru is already like a few steps ahead of us and saw a warning 
um, you will have access to the temporary accounts longer than the workshop. So they will be available like two to three hours after the workshop is done. So you can like really focus now on like understanding what SageMaker pipeline is and how you can create it. And then afterwards, you can still execute a pipeline or change things up a bit with replacing the model ID or the data set and then run it again. So you don't need to rush like through the example to see what the end result is. And yeah, JSON get has been renamed, so it's it, it's no big deal. It's uh, it, it lives in a different place, and uh, and the first parameter has changed as well. But yeah, it, it's it's okay. Don't don't worry about it. <laughs> It'll work. Yeah, and like of course, after training, we want to evaluate our model, and um, I can like jump into the evaluation script since it's like located in scripts evaluate. And then like, so normally what you would expect is that we like load our model and then like run it against some, some testing data set. But since we have done it inside our train method, what we are going to do here is just like looking into our model artifact, loading our evaluation JSON, and then like creating or providing the output for our accuracy to SageMaker. So, if you like run a training without evaluation inside of it, or if you want to like have a valid data set and a test data set, you want to like run additional verification or evaluation, that's something you could do here. But in yeah. our case, we are like just loading the JSON file and extracting the evaluation, which we already have done. Yeah, in this case, we have the JSON file, right? It's it's part of the it's part of the training process. But for some other algorithms, I mean in the past. What I've done is you can just create a, a text file uh, or a JSON file in, uh, in in your model artifact, right? Just save it next to the model, and then SageMaker will uh, archive everything in the model tar.jz, and then you can you can do the same. Here it's just very convenient because we do have the metrics in the JSON file, and that's why we need JSON get to go and parse that. But you can you can do the same behavior. Um, by just saving extra files to the artifact in your training script. That works too. Yes, and then same story as before. We have our processor, and then we have here like um, like something we haven't seen before. It's like a property file. That's exactly what Julian mentioned, is that since we are creating a file inside our processing job, which has some like structure in it, we want to extract this information. So we have sa saved it as JSON file, we have our JSON like name of it, and then like SageMaker will load it behind the scenes, similar to what you would do with Python JSON loads. And then you have like a dictionary where you can like really work with. And then we have like the, the defining again our processing step, which like expects the model artifact, which includes our um, model and our evaluation JSON, and then outputs only the the report, like the the result of our training. And then like in step six, we will see like what we are going to do with this evaluation. But like for now, we like continue with the creation of the pipeline and um, expecting or like assuming that the training would have been successfully and the metrics are good enough to deploy our model. And the first step, what we do is like register our model. Maybe Julian can say a bit more about what what does it mean? Yeah, so so this is really something um, something new that SageMaker pipelines brought. I mean, before SageMaker pipeline was available uh, in SageMaker, you would uh, you would train right. So you would call estimator.fit, get your uh, training job going, and you would have your model artifact in S3. And then, uh, and then you would uh, create the model, which would really make it visible in SageMaker for deployment, and then you would deploy. Uh, the model registry goes a little bit further. As you can see, uh, the, the parameters for a register model include uh, content types, uh, response types, um, instance types, uh, which means you can actually restrict uh, the, the list, the, the, the type of instances for uh, endpoints and for uh, batch transform. Um, so that's super useful because this means no one in, can deploy this to something else. So uh, for example, in a testing scenario, you know, you would want to deploy on very tiny instances because you know they don't need to scale. And for production, you could make sure that you know you do use, let's say, GPU instances and that no one accidentally deploys to CPU instances because production would be slow for 
for this particular model, you know, that kind of thing. And then, and then you have the approval status. So in this case, again, we made it simple. We set it to approved, uh, but you can send it, you can set it to pending manual approval. Okay. And this means that until the status has been changed manually, um, you cannot mm -hmm. deploy the model. So coming back to what I was saying before, um, that's typically what you would use in a production scenario, right? When, when you have an automated job running, um, um, an automated pipeline running, registering the model, and then maybe the data science team looks at the model, runs some tests, uh, look at the evaluation metrics, et cetera, and says, yeah, okay, this is good to go, right? And then they would change the status of the model and then, um, you know, deployment would happen. And actually changing the status could automatically trigger maybe a cloud formation template that goes and deploy, you know, there are many, many ways to do it. But short, long story short, the, the model registry is really important. Uh, and if you use SageMaker Studio, which we're not using today, you can actually browse the registry. You can see the different versions of the model. You can see approval statuses, etc. So the, the traceability angle is, is quite interesting. We're not going to use it today, but just keep that in mind, right? For prod, it's really cool. And then I saw like two questions coming in. First off, was uh, what capacity of RAM is required? And can you like clarify the question a bit more? Like, so each step we have like run so far for processing, training, and evaluation runs on uh, a separate EC2 instance type. So for processing, since it like doesn't require any GPU, you can define like a small CPU based instance, or if you're like running uh, using large data sets, you can like use a CPU uh, compute accelerated. And if you want to like um, for training, go with the GPU. So your training is faster Then select the uh, GPU instance and same for the post processing step. And for like the whole SageMaker pipelines, like workflow, there's no like, there's no need to like um, require or like to uh, yeah to create any compute resource so it's like completely managed yeah it's fully managed. by aws so you don't need to worry about like using it so it's like uh, it only runs when you're running and it will stop by the end of it so there's like no no um, run capacity for it and then the, the second question maybe julian can answer it yeah do so um so the uh, question is uh do model packages become available in, in the model package page so uh, Eric, I, I, I'm assuming you refer to the um, uh, to the AWS console um, for SageMaker, not Studio. So I believe they do appear. Um, uh, I have to say, it makes more sense to check out Stu uh, SageMaker Studio and look at the registry, uh, because you will see uh, you will see the different versions. The you know generally the the, the AWS console is um, you know is really for I would say ops um and uh, and studio is where you would see a lot more um, a lot more information uh on uh for SageMaker pipelines right um but yeah go go and check out it should appear there yeah so so we we are like definitely looking into the studio um like when we are like through the notebook to see what basically what we have created oh yeah we want to see the the blinking lights right <laughs> yes right <laughs> the okay. nice graph <laughs> Philip, yes, there's we'll, one more we'll take one it. more question here. Um, the, are, are we using EKS at any point? No, no. So this? what we are like, everything we run in the notebook and the workshop today is like completely based inside like the SageMaker ecosystem. But as Julian mentioned, these SageMaker pipelines are like not limited to SageMaker services. So what we are doing like at the end is deploying um, our model to a SageMaker endpoint using a custom Lambda step. And if like your company or your client wants to use an EKS or EC2 or ECS or like Lambda to run something, you can easily like deploy it to there and yeah. you can like have a Lambda which executes Absolutely. maybe your CDK um, like project or your CloudFormation template. So yeah. there's like no limitations to SageMaker. Yeah, yeah, you could deploy to Fargate if you, if you wanted. Um, you can, yeah, sure. The Lambda step is, is a very flexible way to do what, whatever you like. Yeah. And talking about the Lambda step, since we have now like added our rec uh, register step, we came to the model deployment step. And uh, what we have done here to like keep it nice and simple, we have created our own model deployment step, which um, requires uh, a permission 
to create our endpoint. So every SageMaker endpoint requires an IAM role to have permission to do things. So if you are like using a model um, um, like um, stored on S3, the SageMaker endpoint needs permission to load the model from S3 to like deploy it. So we have um, created our like model deployment class, which we are going to take a look in a second, where we have our model name, which will be used for the endpoint and the configuration. Then we have, of course, the, the registered model. So we know which model we want to use, which is the output from our step before. Then we have the instance type. We are going to use the G4 DNX large, so which is a um, GPU backed instance. And we can use it because we have defined the instance type in our register model up here. Then we have our IAM permission, which will be applied to the SageMaker endpoint. So it's not applied to the Lambda function we will use, it's applied to the endpoint itself. And then um, we also have uh, included like an auto scaling um, attribute, which you could then like define your auto scaling um, policy. But since we are like not going that much into detail today, it's like just or none. And then if we like go back into the workshop, we have um, a folder called utils, which has a deploy handler and a deploy step. The deploy step is our custom SageMaker pipeline step and the deploy handler is the Lambda function we are going to deploy. And if we take a look at a deploy step, it's like uh, a Python class um, using the step collection as base. We have our input parameters. And then what you can see is we are creating those helper Lambda function using um, the code from our deploy handler. And then we are executing our Lambda step with the parameter we passed into earlier. So it's basically just an abstraction class to automate things easier and keep it nice and simple. And then you could like, if you need like um, custom steps, you could also like use unit tests to make sure everything works. So there's a good question on um, on cost, and it's always it's always important for uh, for everybody, right? So the question is: Is there a difference in cost between the deployment with Lambda compared to the other deployment types? So, to th it, just let 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 me clarify. So here we are not deploying the model on a Lambda function, okay? We are using a Lambda function to create an endpoint, okay? So that that's a difference. So the fact that we use a Lambda step versus uh, some other step makes no, makes no difference, okay? Um, so I guess the bigger question would be, is there a different, is, is there a difference in cost when you deploy to a to actual uh, to a lambda function uh, when you deploy to SageMaker endpoint or when you deploy to ECS or when you deploy to EKS etc cetera, etc cetera. so there's no general answer to this okay um, I, I guess deploying to a lambda function is is interesting um, uh, although you know uh, as far as I know there still isn't GPU support on lambda maybe one day. Um, and uh, and lambdas have the you know they have cold start, so for testing small models why not? Uh, I mean I've seen a lot of people using like small scikit-learn models or uh, XJBoost models, and that works pretty nicely on lambda. For deep learning, it's more complicated because you have a maximum size uh, for the lambda package, and fitting your dependencies in there is next to impossible so you have to go and do stupid tricks like using temporary storage on the lambda in the lambda container blah 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 and there are blog posts out there they're very hacky so fine go and have fun but honestly i wouldn't do it in production um and then if you use uh you know if you use uh, ecs or eks you know you could use spot instances so if you if you manage the possibility of spot interruptions you can go and and, and do that uh it's a little bit more work but it's uh, it's doable and it would be more cost effective than SageMaker um, but SageMaker endpoints uh bring additional capabilities right like model monitoring you know uh, drift detection uh capturing data etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's it's apple to oranges really uh so you, you have to go and understand what your use cases are you strictly in a dev environment and you want minimal cost or are you in production where you want you know auto scaling and and uh, high availability and all the 
machine learning goodies like model monitor, etc. So it, it's a it's a really there's no there's no simple answer to that. But just to give you some perspective. Yeah, and and something maybe to add. So you can see here that's our lambda function which will be executed the code, and we are like <clears throat> using our model defining the endpoint configuration with the instance type and then creating the endpoint and. I guess you don't see any inference code here. So what's very special about the Hugging Face uh, experience on SageMaker is that you can deploy any of the transformer compatible models with any NLP task. So we have trained our model on text classification with the IMDB data set and the distal bird model, and we haven't defined any inference code anywhere. That's like handled by SageMaker behind the scenes in the inference toolkit. So if you would like go to a different solution or maybe have on-premise service or like something else, you also would need to write this code yourself. And as Julian said, like model monitoring yeah. or like scaling, like in the last workshop, maybe for those who haven't participated, definitely check out the uh, the recording. It's on YouTube There we like went through how you can auto scale based on requests coming in with like just a few lines of code. You will be able to like scale your endpoint from one instance type to like four or five and without like any heavy lifting. So you don't need to yeah. ask like your DevOps or infrastructure team yeah. to sure. create scalable solutions. Yeah, generally, I think, you know, if you're a, if you're a data scientist and you don't, uh, you know, you don't particularly lo love DevOps, which, which is fine, you know, uh, I guess DevOps engineers don't particularly love machine learning. So it goes both ways. Uh, if you want a simple way to, to train and deploy models, without messing with servers and VPCs and SSH keys and subnets and all that good stuff, uh, SageMaker is the simplest option, right? Um, if you if you really want to get your training and deployment going and experiment, I think that's uh, that's a good way, right? Uh, and it works for production as well. But you know, if you're if you're a data scientist and and you want to you know you have to create Docker clusters, all of you know all of a sudden it. Your your day isn't isn't turning very well. I think mm -hmm. I love Docker, but you know, when you do machine learning, you want to do machine learning, and that's what SageMaker does. And then, like to answer Kay's question, the deployment lambda also can update the endpoint with the new uh, version. So yeah, as you can see, we are like passing in um, the output from our registration step. So if we would rerun the whole pipeline uh, again and change like maybe a hyperparameter or long, run it for longer training or change our threshold then it would like deploy the new model to SageMaker. And that's like done since we are like providing the new um, like model artifact from the registration and then it will create the endpoint. And I think now it's like the last step in our pipeline, but which is like the fourth step in our like pipeline is the, the, the like the conditional, the check that, yep. okay, we run the evaluation and now do we like register our model in the registry and do we want to deploy it? And therefore we have again defined a parameter uh, with like a default crash for, for uh, 0.8. We can change it. And here we have like what Julian mentioned before, like the conditional step. We are using greater than or equal. And then we have a left side and a right side. And our left side is the the um, like the evaluation accuracy from our JSON file we have saved in the evaluation step. And the right side is our threshold. So if the value in our JSON we have created during training and evaluation is greater or equal to 0 0.8, we are going to execute our registration step and our deployment step. And you can ignore the warning, as Julian said, it yeah. has like moved. So it's like just something. Don't worry about it. Exactly. And since we have now we find our parameter and we talked a bit of, about the like the parameters we use anywhere, we can override them. So yep. we have defined them in each step. I think it's like, so if you want to change a parameter for a specific step, go to like the step and then see, okay, which parameter I have available and I can change it. And here, what I do is change the threshold to 0 0.7 since uh, maybe it's like something above 70% is like a good starter. And I want to make sure that my pipeline runs and the model is deployed to run a few tests. And then I can change it afterwards to like 0 0.9 and then, 9 and then run again. And we also want to run our training for free epoch, change the training batch size since we know, okay, distal bird is not that big and we can fit a bigger batch size into it. And then we have our pipeline here, which accepts all of the default parameters, all of our steps. So here we have the processing step, the training step, the evaluation step, and then the condition step, which includes the nested step from uh, registration and deployment. 
So it's like not like um, one hierarchy level, it's like nested. So if you have a condition step in a condition step, it's also possible. Yep. And then we can like put out the JSON pipeline definition, which is um, something you can copy and deploy from somewhere else. So you could use Python to create your pipeline since it's very like nice to write the code to create a creative thing. And then if you like want to like bring it into a different environment or need to be uh, compliant with some internal guidelines, you could use the, the, yeah, the output and then deploy it using infrastructure as code service. And now we are back to where we started, where we can um, upsert and like create or update our pipeline and then run the pipeline with our pipeline parameters. And I think now it's like almost 30 minutes over. We can jump into studio. All right. Uh, but you, all of them should have a studio available, right? Yep, it is the same for everyone. But uh, yep, the, the studio is there. So you just have to wait like closely two minutes to, to have it set up if it's not already there. Uh, and yeah, you have access to it. Okay. Do you have directions then, on getting to that, uh, Philip? Um, yeah, we have like also on the left side in the SageMaker menu where we open the notebook instance, there should be studio. And then you should some see something in the middle of the screen running and then you can like click on the right side on launch app. I, I mean, I can like also quickly jump into it, I think. Thanks. I think it'll just help clarify for some folks. Yes. We have SageMaker here. And before we went into notebook and notebook instances to run our notebook, and now we have studio here where you should see a user or the app running and then you can go and launch app and then click on studio, which will open a new tab. And then we are in SageMaker Studio. And compared to, to the notebook instance we use, SageMaker Studio provides yeah, more insights to different SageMaker services. We have on the left side, um, yeah, two new navigation can, menu Can you points. zoom in a little bit? I, I, I'm afraid it's it's a bit small. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe I need bigger, I need new glasses. But... <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, yeah, looks better, simply. thanks. Yeah, then we have, we have one section for jump starts, which are like basically um, solutions you can deploy from the beginning. And then we have um, all of the SageMaker resources with projects, pipelines, module registry, which Julian talked a bit about earlier, our endpoints we have deployed, and then of course our pipeline. And um, I run the pipeline before, and then we have created another one when starting the workshop, which was 36 minutes ago, and it successfully run already. And here we can see all of the steps which has been run. So we have our processing step, and now I need to watch out a bit. And on the right side, um, you have like the input and output parameter we define. So here we can see basically the parameters we have provided through the parameter values and of course the output. And, and then, the logs, which, yes. which are a godsend, I have to say, because sometimes, you know, we, we always make it look a little too easy, but trust me, you know, my pipelines never run on the first try. So, uh, you know, I forgot something and it's, it's red and, and, you know, and, and I can go and check out the logs and, and, and this is, this is really convenient. So you can see exactly why a step failed and you can see it inside studio because the alternative would be, uh, you have to go to Amazon CloudWatch, which is the, the monitoring uh, service for AWS and CloudWatch logs. And you have to go and find, uh, you know, the the particular log for the particular job, and uh, yeah, and it's not it's not fun, right? So uh, if your pipelines don't work, you can see it right here. You can see oh, one of those boxes, one of those steps here would be red, and you can check out the logs. And as Philip said, you know, you can check your inputs, uh, and you could quickly figure out why something failed, right? So uh, very very convenient. And if we check our like evaluation accuracy, we have our threshold and the default value was 0 0.8. And we like overrode it um, in our parameters dictionary before starting the instance. And here we can see it's like 0 0.7. So it's like it overrides the things we provided. And then like, of course, we have the registration step and then the deployment step. And I think before like 
um, looking into the endpoint, we can see in the uh, module registry, we have here the hugging face model package group where all of your yeah. models uh, should be added. And here you should see like the different versions and yeah. exactly what Julia mentioned. We can like jump into it. We have our approval status. We have no metrics registered. Yeah, I we think can publish metrics. We can, yeah. Yes. And then we have like more settings yeah. too, um, which was used or which will be used for inference. What is, where's the model stored and yeah. the trial rerun. Yeah. So for traceability, like I said, you know, m versioning models is always difficult. I don't know how you do it, but you know, a lot of people just save files in a in an S3 bucket, and they 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 use V1 and V2 and V3 in the in the name, which is always a a recipe for disaster. Um, so here, automatically, you have versioning, and and you know exactly which um, which artifact corresponds to which version. And there's another part of the SageMaker SDK where you can actually do a linear tracking. Uh, so it's pretty simple. You can easily figure it out. And for example, you could say, you know, I want for this particular artifact, I want to know which training sets were used and which training script were used. So all the artifacts, when you use SageMaker pipelines, all the input artifacts, code, data, algos, etc., that actually go into training a model are tracked. Okay. So lineage tracking is the keyword you want to look for. And, and this is available in there as well, automatically when you use pipelines. Mm -hmm. and, and now I went like to the endpoints and that's something you need to change um, to run inference in the notebook. We, we, there's like a small little uh, mistake in it since we are like running on multiple accounts. We added the, the timestamp to our endpoint yeah. so all of you can deploy it. And if you go to the endpoint, you can find an endpoint and then we need to like copy the timestamp of it and jump back into our pipeline. And um, we also provided the link on, you can like directly jump into the percentage management console to see our endpoint. And then you like um, need to create a timestamp and then for the endpoint name. So the endpoint name um, currently on your side should be just model ID and data set. But since you are like running on shared account, we added the timestamp to it. So all of you can create the model endpoint. And then if I create my uh, predictor object, I can run like the predictions for the model. We have here an input for a movie, um, which is positive. And then we have a, a, an input for um, like a review basically, which is, yeah, not good. I would say negative. And then at the end, we have not also provided some uh, functionality like to clean up everything again. For the temporary account, it, like it, uh, it's not that important because they will like tear down anyway, but if you're like doing it on your personal account, always make sure that like you don't um, run unnecessary compute when you're not using it and then you can like just run the last cell and everything will be deleted. So we have a question on um, on load balancing and, and auto scaling. I think that's an interesting point. So yes, indeed, the, the previous uh, webinar was uh, what touched upon the topic, but what can I quick, what I can quickly explain is, so SageMaker endpoints are automatically uh, load balanced. Um, um, and so you, let me rephrase. So when you deploy a SageMaker endpoint, you specify how, how many instances uh, actually back the endpoint, right? So I think here we're using a single instance. But if we used two, three, four instances, uh, traffic is automatically load balanced across those instances. Okay, so you don't have to create a load balancer. You don't have to scale the load balancer. All that stuff is built in. Now, if you want to scale the endpoint itself, of course, you can do it manually. You can update manually the number of instances. Uh, and you can also set up auto scaling, right? So you can set an auto scaling policy on your endpoint. And say you know whenever uh, whenever my uh, requests per second exceed this number you know scale, right? Um, so that's that's as much as you need to do. And um, and of course, when you have multiple instances on an endpoint, they're automatically spread across the different availability zones, right? So load balancing is built in, high availability is built in, and auto scaling you can pretty easily enable, right? Hope so. yeah. answers the question. Yeah. So, so if you like, I, I just shared you the video of the last workshop, and we we like really dedicated the whole like session last time on 
how to create an endpoint with similar to what we have here, one instance count one way, and then how to like add an auto scaling group and also add an auto scaling policy based on request. And yep. um, you can like also look at the SageMaker uh, GitHub repository where you are currently it, like running the workshop three and workshop two, you should find lab three, which um, like goes through it step by step. We take a look at model monitoring before auto scaling and after auto scaling. And I think in total to add auto scaling to your endpoint is around like 15 lines of code, which yeah. you additionally run. So it's like not that much and it will be like applied immediately. Okay. Are there more questions about SageMaker pipeline? There's a question on model monitoring. Um, I'm not sure I understand. So I'll answer the question the way I understand it, but please correct me if I'm wrong, okay? Um, so SageMaker model monitoring uh, requires that you send individual prediction requests, okay? So that means in the payload that is sent to the endpoint, you need to have a single instance. A single data point, right? If you if you have multiple um, data samples in there, um, data capture will work, okay? But um, uh, model monitoring will fail, right? So don't ask me why. Uh, hopefully that gets uh, um, fixed at some point. It's it's a restriction of the service, as far as I know. But yeah, that's the one. Yeah, okay. Thanks, uh, Omayun. That's what I thought. Uh, so yeah, that's it's it's not a bug. It's a feature. So again, data capture will work, but baselining and model monitoring will fail uh, because they only support. I, I guess you know the file format is JSON lines. So if you have more than one instance per line, their parser doesn't work, and somebody has to go and and add that feature. So yep. Hashtag AWS wishlist on Twitter. I I tried. <laughs> I tried to get them to implement it, but they're busy, right? <laughs> so help me out. Any more or further questions to what we have shown you today? If you guys are going through this later and um, have any other questions or something comes up, uh, you can join our Discord. I'll send the link again here in the chat and uh, we can talk about it there. Yeah, so if you want to stay in touch, I, I just posted our uh, uh, Twitter accounts. Um, and of course, Nate is on Twitter. I should post Nate. Uh, Give me a second. <laughs> I'll find you. All good. I have an underscore. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, you have an underscore. That's why. Sorry, yes. sorry, sorry, sorry. It's very sad. Yeah. So, um, yeah, get in touch. Follow us. Uh, keep uh, keep an eye on the on the YouTube channel for more. Keep an eye on the Discord channel. Um, send us feedback. Send us questions. Yeah, we're happy to interact and. Uh, and share your feedback. If you have AWS feedback as well on, on, on Hugging Face on SageMaker, we're more than happy to read it and um, and get our AWS friends to uh, to add more features as well, right? Last question we got, are there any plans for integration with Google Vertex AI? <laughs> Should I take this one? Yeah. <laughs> um, so short answer is no. Uh, our uh, our preferred partner uh, is uh, for for uh, machine learning on the on the cloud is currently AWS. Uh, doesn't mean we're not uh, cooperating with everybody else, uh, but for now, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's not in the picture. But there are so many other ways you can do hugging face uh, in the cloud, right? So um, you can use containers, you can use virtual machines. You know Nate and and all the DevRel team. They have lots of demos and uh, yep. And uh, we'll uh, be adding more. 
<laughs> okay. Yeah, so don't worry. Lots awesome. more coming. I wish I could tell. Great, then I guess we can sign off here. Like, have everyone a nice day, nice night for the Australian or like Asian people. Yeah, and if and it's then... later than 11 p.m., come on, that's it. It's it's enough. <laughs> it's a, please, please, you know, we feel terrible. Go to bed, go to bed, right? Have enjoy enjoy your life. It's enough stage maker for one night. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye. Bye bye.